Our next talk is Tenacious, the Resilient Nature of the Black-Footed Ferret by Tori Anko from the Buffalo Bills Center of the West and Draper Natural History Museum. Long title for a short place. Um, so yeah, pets, uh, pets and pet owners significantly impact native wildlife populations. And we know dogs and cats kill birds and small, small mammals estimated in the billions. Um, but as I'm about to tell you, not all pets are created equal and some can actually aid wildlife conservation efforts. So at the Draper Natural History Museum, we hope that every specimen tells a story. I mean, at least that's what we hope. Um, and this is the story about a mammal that has survived two extinctions. Um, and so in the late 1800s, black-footed ferrets estimated in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. Um, but government-sponsored uh, wildlife campaigns or extermination campaigns to wipe out prairie dogs has vastly eliminated black-footed ferret from its historic range. And so by the 1960s, we thought that these guys were basically extinct until a population was found in South Dakota. Um, and this was astounding because prairie dogs provide, their ecosystem engineers, their keystone species, so they provide habitat for a wide range of other species. Um, and they also are an important food resource. And so we know black-footed ferrets persist, their diet is over 90% composed of black, uh, prairie dogs. Um, and so no prairie dogs, no black-footed ferrets. Um, and so like any well-intentioned adult thinking that their child was in danger, we took the ferrets that we found in South Dakota into captivity with the hopes of establishing a breeding, uh, captive breeding population. So from 71 to 73, we brought in nine ferrets into captivity Four of those ferrets contracted canine distemper virus, killed, were killed, and then that virus spread to the remaining uh, ferrets in that captive breeding population, and they all died. Um, so what does this have to do with pets? Well, fast forward a few years later, it's 1981, 1981, and a ranch dog named Shep from northwestern Wyoming proudly presents his owner with an odd-looking trophy. Not nearly as impressed, the rancher proceeds to dispose of the trophy and throw it onto a compost pile. But the rancher's spouse says, hey, you know what, that thing looked pretty interesting, let's bring it to a taxidermist and get it mounted. So they bring it up along, and the taxidermist says, hey, you know what you have here? You have a black-footed ferret. We thought these things went extinct years ago. Um, and so obviously this generated a lot of interest among the wildlife conservation community and wildlife managers. So Game and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, ascended upon this ranch in northwestern Wyoming with the hopes of bringing this species back. And they monitored it for a good while and said, okay, we have 130 ferrets here, 140 ferrets here. And then in 1985, K9 distemper virus rolls through and wipes out the vast majority of the population. So once again, the population, or the global population of ferrets is just a small community here in Matisse, Wyoming. And they decide, like any adult that's worried about their child in danger, they round them up again and they bring them back into captivity for a captive breeding program. This time it was successful. They were able to bring 18 ferrets in, 15 of those ferrets bred and produced progeny. However, only seven of those uh, produced a lineage. So of the ones that bred, those, their offspring did not breed. Only seven of them did. So today the global population of black-footed ferrets is descendant from seven individuals. Um, and all of this was, uh, was done and helpful by a dog named Shep in uh, <laughs> northwestern Wyoming. So today they occupy a good chunk of their range. Um, it's, only, it's still only a fraction, but there's uh, about seven breeding count, um, facilities that are participating in the captive breeding program to save black for the ferret and the uh, global population descendant from this remnant group of uh, ferrets from northwestern Wyoming. And so it's conservation successes and lessons like these that the Draper Natural History Museum tries to tell through our specimens. Um, we know that not everybody has the time to read every single graphic panel, so we do try to leverage where possible um, the most interest that we can to get them to stay around a little bit longer and read a little bit more and hopefully walk away with having an increased understanding of museums um, and the collections they maintain. So thank you.